welcome everybody. Greetings everybody watching live or later on YouTube and we're very happy to welcome you to the second in our autumn series of online Invisible Histories talks. Big thank you particularly today to Dave Wetzel who is our speaker today. He's the Vice President of the Labour Land Campaign and he's going to be talking on the topic the historic theft of land. So over to you Dave. Thanks very much. Uh, hopefully we're going to see the PowerPoint. There we go. Um, if you can move slide, please. I, I want to... Uh, there we go. Thomas Paine, in The Rights of Man, wrote these words, and I'll read them. The aristocracy are not the farmers who work. Oh, God. My screen is covered up. The aristocracy are not the farmers who work the land and raise the produce, but are the mere consumers of the rent. And when compared with the active world, are the drones, a seraglio of males who neither collect the honey nor form the hive, but exist only for lazy enjoyment. And that was written in 1792. Slide, please. I feel strongly, obviously, about the theft of land, and yet it gets very little coverage and few people pay attention to it. We are interested in things like the great train robbery. We're interested in, or our younger People are interested in the Grand Theft Auto and Vice City, but uh, I think uh, compared to the theft of land, they're nothing. You know, the theft of land is so much greater. I was looking at the privatizations that took place since 1979 when uh, Mrs. Thatcher got elected prime minister, and uh, what privatizations have taken place the RBS sale or uh, the sale of council houses, these are infinitesimal compared to the huge amount of publicly owned land that has been sold and lost to us during that same period, about 40 times more value in the value of land sold by government and local authorities than uh, we've lost through privati other privatisations. Slide, please. Tony Benn once said, the theft of our land was the first privatisation in Britain. In fact, he didn't say it once. He said it many, many times. Slide, please. I want you to join me for a journey, a journey into space. Imagine that this planet Earth that we live on is so heavily polluted that we can no longer breathe the air or grow our crops. And so therefore we have to move out of our own galaxy and fly off and try and find a new planet for us to settle on. Slide, please. And uh, we travel for several weeks looking for this new planet. It has to have all the attributes of Earth and eventually we find one slide. And the planet we've landed on has the water, it has the oxygen, the air, it has the land, it has the environment that we need to survive. So 7 billion people get out of our spaceships and we all assemble on the beach. Slide, please, on the beach of one of the uh, new continents. And as we're standing there, all seven billion of us, um, the General Secretary, slide please, of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Guterres, makes a speech to the assembled throng. And uh, what he says is this, I want all the people on planet Earth who owned and controlled the oil and the oil fields, slide please, to go out and explore this planet. 
shall be the oh that's the beautiful planet by the way uh slide please i want the oil companies the oil shakes to explore the planet and find where the oil is buried and when you find it i want you to earmark those sites put fences round claim them as yours and then as we need oil we can buy it from you and our grandchildren can buy it from your grandchildren and similarly i want the beers and all the big mining companies to explore this planet and look for gold and look for diamonds and look for the uh, minerals the valuable minerals we're going to need and when you find those deposits and those sites i want you to ring fence them and then when we come to use these essential elements we can uh, buy them from you and our grandchildren will be able to buy them from your grandchildren finally i want the duke of westminster and all the big rich landowners from planet earth to explore this new planet and find all the most valuable land the most fertile land for agriculture and farming i want you to find the sites on rivers where cities are going to grow and prosper i want you to find the sites overlooking lakes and oceans where people are going to want to build their houses and you can put fences and walls around those sites and then when we come to use those sites we can pay you rent for permission to use the land of this planet and our grandchildren our great grandchildren and our great great grandchildren ad infinitum will be able to pay your children your grandchildren and your great 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 grandchildren ad infinitum rent for the use of this planet slide please and at the back of the crowd there's a small group of little children and they actually stand up and they shout out hey mister where's our share and just think about that in terms of planet earth today a little baby that has been born on this planet since i started speaking to you what is their share of planet earth if there's a child of one of the aristoc ar aristocratic families like the duke of westminster then they're likely to have a bountiful share of the planet's natural wealth but most kids being born today are not going to be in that position and what i'm addressing today is two things one how wrong it has been that our land has been stolen from ourselves and from our ancestors and two perhaps what we can now do about it how can we redress the injustice of land theft slide humans started as hunter gatherers and for about 1.8 million years all land was freely available there were no landowners and nobody had to pay any rent slide please and then only about 10,000 years ago 8000 BC we started farming we started growing our own crops and keeping animals for food for clothing and other purposes so farming is only a recent thing 10,000 years we've been farming 1,790,000 years we were hunter gatherers on freely available land slide obviously the person who sowed the seed wanted to be the same person to reap the harvest this meant that the sense of place and location first appeared as an important factor for mankind and interestingly today economists who study production 
pay very little attention to place and location. But the people who started farming, if they were sowing the seeds, they wanted to be sure that they were around to gather the harvest. They didn't want somebody else to take over the land and get the benefit of all their work. So the idea of security of tenure came about. And it's quite natural. It's not an evil thing. It's a good thing that people should have security of tenure. But you can have security of tenure without the need for ownership. For example, when I was on the Greater London Council back in the 1980s, we had 112 farms creating the green belt around London. And the uh, farmers didn't own those farms. They rented the farms from the GLC, the Greater London Council. And they were happy to pay their rent. And we were happy to use that rent to provide valuable services to the people of London. Everybody was happy. And uh, similarly, the City of London. The City of London gets most of its income from city cash. And city cash is the rent of the land they own in and around London. And uh, tenants are happy to pay rent to the city, and the city is able to use that to provide services for the city of London. And I'm talking about the square mile. And they can also use that money to give to uh, charities and things of that nature. Slide, please. Agriculture provided surplus food. And with extra food, we weren't all rushing around, hunting and gathering all day long. We had extra time, time for art, for science, and indeed just for thinking, philosophy, economics, whatever. And people found it more efficient to actually gather together, to have one baker, one shoemaker, uh, one person that uh, swept the roads and things of that nature. So towns began to grow because people found it more efficient to gather together in towns. And we are seeing today on our planet that today over half the population, just over half population, That's odd. We've lost Dave. He's muted. He's gone. He's gone. Oh dear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's um, pause the share. Oh, okay. Stop the share. Right. Okay. That's a shame. It was all going so well. Let us hope that he is about to. Uh, he is about to start. He is about to come back. Let's. We'll keep an eye out for him. Oh no! Yes, he's there. He's at the bottom. He's of there. The third screen. I'm not finding him yet. He's at. He's at the. Oh, he's there he is. Yes. All right, Dave. Can you hear us? Oh no! He's gone again. <laughs> Um, oh. Anybody else? Uh, anybody else good on the uh, on uh, historic theft of land? <laughs> oh, Dave, you're back. Can you hear us, Dave? Um. He's a co-host. There he is. Yes. He's he's music right. Dave, can you unmute yourself, Dave? You should have a message to unmute yourself. Press a button saying unmute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you hear You're me back. now? Yeah, oh, we can hear you. Terrible. I don't know what I don't know what happened there, but we will I go think back. I think it's me. I've got my computer plugged in. I'm on the internet, but I think it was uh, my end. I, I yeah. Well, the, the the rest of us were certainly here and and agog to to hear more. So we'll go back to where we were which is i think perhaps is that where we were? 
Yeah, talking about the surplus and towns began yes. to grow, and that is still continuing today. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry, go back one. It's interesting that the governance of the towns was in the hands of the temples and the priests. And um, one slide, please. And uh, they didn't give the land in the towns away. These towns were sort of on the Euphrates in the Middle East. Uh, they didn't give the land away. They rented it out. And people were happy to rent that land in order to be in the town and have all the security and the trade and the social connections that come from living in a town. But the rent that the temples collected wasn't wasted. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, spent on just making golden temples. It, it was spent on providing services to have roads, clean water, viaduct, all the things uh, that the town services the town need, needed came from the rent of the land. So even with urbanisation, land was still held in common. And that's an important point I'd like to put across, that when I talk about land, I think of rolling hills and the beautiful countryside, but I'm also thinking of land under my house, I'm sitting here now, land in towns and cities, land with factories, office blocks, land with warehouses, uh, lands with swimming pools, all, all the things we use, the surface of the planet is what I'm talking about. Uh, slide, please. But of course, human nature came into the story and we found that uh, rich, powerful people uh, wanted to gain land for their personal benefit. They didn't want to share the land wealth with other people. And although they didn't make the land, they managed to put fences and convince other people, sometimes with um, laws that were quite outrageous. They managed to convince people that land was theirs and that other people should pay them rent. They didn't provide anything except permission to put the second brick on top of the first brick of a, for a person that wanted to build a home. But uh, that is what has happened, and that is the situation we see today. And it all derives from these early days where people fought to buy, to, to gain and control land. And, of course, other people have bought the land from the original thieves and if I steal your bicycle and somebody buys it from me, it's not their bicycle, it's still your bicycle. Slide, please. Thomas Paine in Agrarian Justice also said, cultivation is at least one of the greatest natural improvements ever made by human intervention. It has given to created earth a tenfold value. But the landed monopoly that began with it has produced the greatest evil. It has dispossessed more than half the inhabitants of every nation of their natural inheritance without providing for them, as ought to have been done, an indemnification for that loss, and has thereby created a species of poverty and wretchedness that did not exist before. I find those words very fundamental. And uh, he talks about half the inhabitants. I see it in terms of the 1% and the 99%. 1% own and control the land of this planet on which we live. The others, the 99%. Dave, we can't hear you. We need you to unmute yourself again. Oh dear. There you I'm go. You're sure. back. You're back. You're fine. Where, where did we hear? <laughs> Just a few seconds. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Can you go back one slide, please? Oh, 
Oh, you're going forward, aren't you? Back. I want the Anglo-Saxons. That... No, you, you're going forward. I want to go back. Well, everybody's got a trailer now of what I'm going to be saying, but I still want to go back. That's it. So the Anglo-Saxons, oh, and it says, please remove this window away from the shared application. Is that you or me? So the Anglo-Saxons uh, last. Sorry, about Dave. Well, I think I'm going to get stuck with that now, unfortunately. So sorry. Uh, bear, bear with oh, us, folks. Okay. Just, just read what you can. <laughs> Anglo-Saxons uh, arrived at about 410 AD, uh, and they were around for over 600 years uh, before 1066, when they were overthrown, and. They had a complicated 10-year system, which uh, included an awful lot of common land where people could graze their animals, they could pick firewood, they could get stuff to build their homes, they could build their homes on, on land. But they also, for some land, they had to pay rent to their immediate lord. And I've been unable to find how that rent was shared, whether the lord just kept it personally, and we see these graves and things that uh, we find hoards, Anglo-Saxon hoards, where there's great uh, golden uh, jewellery and stuff like that. So obviously some of it was wasted, but um, hopefully they used it sensibly. But it was more of a golden age than after the Norman Conquest, which we're now going to come on to. Slide. So William the Conqueror won the Battle of Hastings, ruled the most of uh, England, and he, um, I was told at school, gave the land to his knights and barons who helped him at Hastings. But now I know that is not true. He did not give the land away. He rented the land to them. And they had to provide services. Most of those services were military services. They had to keep so many archers and so many knights ready to go off and fight wars. But some of those services were um, a, a giving of food and giving of uh, produce of the land uh, to the king. And similarly, the churches, he didn't give the land to the churches. They had to provide services like education, social welfare, hostels, which were hospitals uh, for the sick. So he wasn't giving the land away. In the name of the state, on behalf of the state, he was collecting the rent of land. And all the income that he had came from land tax, his taxes on land, which are really collecting the rent of land. Slide, please. And then <clears throat> we're told about King John and the Magna Carta. What a wonderful thing it is for us to celebrate uh, because it was the freedom of, of the ordinary person. Of course, that's not quite the story, the true story. Yes, it did give us habeas corpus, and I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> but the most important thing about Magna Carta and why the important barons dragged King John to Runnymede uh, and threatened him and made him sign the Magna Carta was they wanted to stop paying rent to the king. They wanted to own their land absolute. And uh, it didn't quite go that far because the best of landowners only have a freehold. It's a holding which of land which belongs to the monarch and a freeholding just means you don't pay rent for it but all land in this country today actually belongs to the monarch and some people are leaseholders and some people are freeholders the freeholders don't own the land the monarch owns the land but they hold it free of paying rent and uh, because John was threatened, 
he allowed the barons to stop having to pay rent to the country, to the king and to the state. Slide, please. But two years later, there was a much more important document in terms of the working class, uh, and that was the Charter of the Forests. The Charter of the Forest was agreed in 1217. A lot of its components came from the Magna Carta, but it's also known as the Little Carta, the Little Charter. But it restored the commoners' rights to use of the forests. And when we think of forests, we think of large woodlands and all that. But in those days, the forests meant land that had been enclosed, but uh, usually by um, the king or other people. And um, it included heathland. So what the charter of the forest gave the ordinary person was a chance to keep their cattle on the forests, a chance to go and collect firewood, a chance to go and collect wood and building materials to build homes, and of course the chance to pick up nuts and go uh, grazing for food that they needed for their family, pick mushrooms uh, and things of that nature. Um, it was an important concession to the workers who were being denied those very things uh, and were being impoverished because of that. Slide, please. And then in 1381, there came the Peasants' Revolt, or what is also known as the Great Rising. And what Tyler and John Bull are my heroes. And like many radicals, John Bull was ridiculed. He was called the Mad Parson of Kent. And one of the things he used to say was, when Adam dwelt and Eve spun, who then was the gentleman? Meaning to say, in ancient times, in the Garden of Eden, for people who are religious, who owned the land? Who was the general? Who's the landowner? And of course, it means there were no landowners. And it's nice to think that John Ball was trying to tell people the same story that I'm trying to tell you today. But, of course, historians have played down the importance of the uprising against landowners. And uh, they talk of many other things, but you hardly hear how bad land ownership was in terms of oppressing people. The law demanded that serfs should labour on the landowner's land, sometimes for life, sometimes for a few days, sometimes during the harvest when they wanted to harvest their own crops, they had to drop down their tools, go and harvest the landlord's crops first. And uh, it limited the wages that a working labourer could get. There had been the uh, Black Death, and that meant a shortage of labour, uh, and wages were naturally rising because of a shortage of labour. And uh, Parliament passed a law stopping the increase in wages, and uh, workers were penalised for actually asking for higher wages. And they also tied workers to the local manor. And so they couldn't actually move from one district to another seeking work. They were tied to the area of the local manor. And of course, there were huge penalties. The penalties included branding so that everybody could see the mark on your face uh, that you've broken the law uh, and imprisonment uh, and uh, I don't suppose prison today is a jolly ride, but you imagine in the uh, early Middle Ages, uh, prisons were not a place anybody would want to go to. Slide, please. And I argue that not just at this time, but the whole history of the British Parliament from 1215 has a unique history and its unique history is one of the landowning class trying to get rid of their obligations 
And they didn't have to go to Parliament and appeal to MPs or other people to legislate on their behalf. They were the Parliament. They were the MPs. You had to own land in order to become an MP. In fact, you had to own land or lease land worth more than £10 a year in order to actually vote uh, for an MP. Uh, and so it seems to me, and again, story that the historians ignore, that Parliament is a story of selfishness. And it's a story of landowners looking after their own class. And to do that, by getting rid of taxes on the land, they had to find taxes for the king somewhere else. So they started taxing the traders in, in the towns and the cities. And eventually, as we know, they start, started taxing workers, taxing workers for everything, almost everything uh, they buy and sell, uh, and taxing workers for uh, every penny over £12,000 today uh, that they earn in wages. So instead of these rich landowners funding the coffers of parliament today, the coffers of the government today, we have people on low wages, 12,000 a year, being taxed to pay for services which could naturally be paid for by the natural rent of land. As soon as land itself is free, it's a free gift of nature. We don't have to buy it from nature. And it's a free gift, not to one generation, back in 1066 or earlier, it's a free gift to every generation. It's a free gift to the people being born today. And land has a value. When only one person wants to use a site, it has a value to that person, but it has no monetary value. But as soon as two people or more are competing for the use of that site, the value of land arises. And that value is rent. It's annual rent. It's something that we need to understand. Our economists should be studying the rent of land. And I urge them to read the works of Henry George or, or David Ricardo. The rent of land is a natural thing. As you improve an area, the rent of land will go up. You build a new railway and people want to travel on it, they want to live near the stations. So the rent of land arises around the station. In London, when we built the Jubilee Line extension, the Jubilee Line extension costs £3.2 billion to build. We now know the rent of land in the first 10 years from when it was thought about, when it was built, but from 1992, to 2002 and it opened in 2000 the first 10 years the rent of land within a thousand yards of the stations went up by 2.4 billion so it sorry 2.8 billion so it was almost enough just the rent of land around the stations was enough to pay for that railway uh, and we let that go to private individuals. And then we tax people's wages. We tax people's trade. We tax people's savings in order to build that railway. Dave, it's your five-minute warning. You said to tell oh, you right. when you have five minutes to go. OK. So do I get injury time? So, <laughs> so if we think about Parliament today, and I'm always lobbying Parliament, as uh, vice president of the Labour land campaign, and we go and talk to MPs. Some are very responsive, but I would say the majority are not responsive to the idea of a land value tax. And I wonder, I'm not making accusations, I just wonder, is it because almost every MP in Parliament is a landowner? Slide, please. So remember, historically, all land was freely available to all. So landowners have stolen our land. How have they done it? This isn't a complete list. And if some of you could add to this story, I would welcome it. I'll give you my email at the end. 
First, military conquest. Secondly, persuading the king, Magna Carta was one example, but there were many others. Thirdly, expanding their estates illegally onto the common land. Imagine today somebody builds a fence around Hampstead Heath and says, that's mine. And if you want to come in and walk on the heath, you've got to pay me rent. It's outrageous. They encroached on the edge of their fields onto public roads. English enclosures from the 12th to the 19th century, often made legal by an act of parliament. But that wasn't difficult. One MP said, you support my enclosure and I'll support yours because they were all landowners. Sometimes parts of Leicestershire, for example, were illegally uh, uh, enclosed. No act of parliament. Uh, and of course, the Highland clearances, which were much more brutal even than the English enclosures. But I would love somebody who, who's a good storyteller to write a story about the a family living during the time of the English enclosures. I think it would draw attention uh, to this outrage. Slide, please. I won't go into great detail now about milestones, but you can find them in the middle of fields. Now, why would a milestone be in the middle of a field and not at the edge? It's because the land for the road was stolen. Move on, please. Warwickshire County Council knew this, and when they went to build a wider road between Stainbridge and Kenilworth from the narrow road that existed, they actually recovered without charge 16,000 square yards of land either side of the road that they were then able to use to widen the road. And yet the uh, most councils actually pay landowners for the stolen land when they need to widen a road. Slide, please. Henry VIII, no time. You all know the story of Henry VIII. He stole the land, gave it to the uh, people that supported him. The church was left without land and people who relied on the church for services, education, health, etc. They lost those services. If he'd rented the land to his supporters, that would have been one thing. It's outrageous what he did. Move on, please. I won't go into detail on the enclosures. You can read Barbara Hammond's Village Labourer for yourself. Move on, please. Move on, please. The Scottish Highland clearances were much more brutal uh, and people were literally forced out of their homes. Their homes burnt down and they were left to exist in the snow on uh, beaches, etc. Many died and uh, many emigrated. Scotland has still not recovered the population it had before the Highland clearances. Slide, please. The interesting thing is when we go to Scotland, the land question is much more in the forefront of political discussion in Scotland than ever it is in this country. There's been lots of protests. These are some of them. I've left a lot out. If you can help me, I'd love to hear from you and you tell me what protests I've left out. Slide, please. Similarly, economists supporting land reform. There's many more than this. Uh, we couldn't include them all. To me, the important one here is Henry George because he developed the thinking of his predecessors, including Adam Smith. And it amazes me, Adam Smith, I, I thought, was a horrible economist until I read him. And um, I started reading really on road pricing. I was giving talks abroad on road pricing and congestion charging. And I thought, well, what did Adam Smith say about this? He, he talks about toll roads. And what he said, a cart taking essential goods to a village for the workers in that village should pay a lower toll than the post chase carrying idle rich people uh, for entertainment or leisure. Um, so he wasn't such a bad bloke, and particularly as he supported the idea of a land value tax. He was funded by a landowner, so he didn't develop his thinking very much, but Henry George developed it much farther, and I urge you to read all of his books, particularly Progress and Poverty. Slide, please. The Garden City Movement, you can look up Ebenezer Howe. He's one of my heroes. And uh, the important thing here is 
the garden cities are built on three principles. One is good planning, good town planning, bringing the city and the countryside together. Two is good, beautiful architecture. And if you listen to lectures today, that's all you hear about a garden city. But Ebenezer Howard had read Progress and Poverty and some of the other works by Henry George. He was what we call a Georgist, and he wanted to put it into practice. And so when he built his garden, garden cities at Letchworth and Welling Garden City, he didn't give the people the land. He didn't sell them the land. He rented them the land, and he used the land rent for them to decide how it could be used to provide public services. That all got privatised under Thatcher. But that was the concept. Even today, Letchworth has about £2 million a year they give to the Boy Scouts and the Red Cross and other good causes in their city uh, because of uh, Ebenezer's understanding of the role of rent and how it grows when a city grows and improves. Next slide. Now, annual land value tax, it's... Um, intended to be used to reduce or replace taxes on production, trade and savings. And in addition, it could be used to recoup the increased land values that arise from valuable new infrastructure, things like new railways, etc. But it works by valuing every plot of land for its optimum permitted use. That is what the market would want to use the land for but also what the community says that land is allowed to be used for. And then a percentage rate is applied, a bit like the business rate system today, where you pay so much in the pound, but it needs to be collected annually. It could be charged weekly, monthly, quarterly, but it needs to be a periodic tax. It can't be a one-off tax. And... Uh, it is uh, the best example of land value capture. Land value capture encompasses a whole lot of taxes on land. But the real true land tax is a land value tax, certainly not any one-off tax. Slide, please. These are the main benefits of a land value tax. I'll let you read those for yourselves afterwards if you've downloaded the slideshow. Slide, please. Jump to. Oh, that one. Yeah. At the end of the benefits, um, I say, because we all create land wealth, we should share it fairly. And then I remind you of the boys and girls who were uh, on the new planet who say, hey, mister, what about my share? You know, it really is important we consider everybody sharing land wealth and not just wealthy landowners. Slide, please. And of course, Land value tax is the key, I believe, to sharing land wealth. Personally, I support the nationalisation of land. And if I'm asked about compensation, I say to the landowners, no, it won't be necessary for you to compensate us for the generations of our forefathers who were denied access to land. We'll call the slate clean and we'll just take it without any compensation. But again, these are past attempts at uh, introducing some sort of land tax. I know there's a, one that is missing, for sure. If you can tell me any that are missing, please let me know. Thanks. Move on, please. A development tax is a no, no, no. It's a one-off tax. And you're only taxed if you develop the land. If you tax me for buying cigarettes to smoke, I can stop smoking and not pay your tax. If you tax me for developing land, I can avoid your tax by not developing the land. And that's exactly what happened in 1947, 1967 and 1977. Don't let's go down that road again. I could give a whole 40 minute talk about development land tax and why we don't do it. I talked to Gordon Brown about his planning gain supplement uh, and uh, not because of me, but because of all of us, right wing people as well as left wing people saying don't have a planning gain supplement. Slide, please. That's a reading list. It could be much, much longer. Slide, please. 
I expect most of you recognise this. Many of you will have played this game and you will have thought that it was invented in 1933 by a man called Charles Darrow. Parker Brothers gave him a dollar for every um, game that they sold and he became a multi-millionaire in the 1930s. But the true story of the origins of the game go much earlier than 1933. 30 years earlier. Slide, please. I should have given you uh, Lizzie McGee's photo because she deserves to be recognised. Look at this game on the right. Look at um, the top middle pink picture um, section. You see that on all sides. RR sounds for, stands for railroad. It's almost, this was done in 1903. There you have railroads. You have on the top right, um, trespass. Uh, some lord of the baron owns that land. Um, it, it, it's a site you land on. And because you're trespassing, you go to the bottom left. You go to jail. Very similar to uh, what we uh, know of in the uh, Monopoly game. Top left, there's a poor house and Central Park. Free Today, that's free car park, I think. It says free parking on Monopoly book. But you can see it's almost identical to the Monopoly book. So our friend Charles Darrow, the millionaire, multi-millionaire, didn't invent the game. He cheated and copied it from Lizzie Maggie. There's another long story I could tell about that. <laughs> But the original game, the Landlord's game, <laughs> is probably a boring game. It's a boring game because unlike Monopoly, where one person wins and everybody else is made bankrupt, in the Landlord's game, the rent you pay when you land on a property goes into a common pool, a common purse. And that common purse is shared by all the players. So in the Landlord's game, everybody is a winner and nobody loses because they all share the rent of land. And uh, I want our country, I want the whole world, where everybody becomes winners and nobody is a loser because we all share the rent of land. Next slide, please. And that's my thank you to you and uh, my request that if you have any ideas, apart from the poor presentation today, if you have any ideas how the slideshow itself could be improved with better information or facts I've left out or things I've included that you might disagree with, please do get in touch. Phone is fine and email is even better. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. I'm, I'm sorry we speeded up there, but I'm glad we I'm glad we got there because that landlord's game looks uh, looks great. Although we've got a game called Class Struggle, which is uh, a board game, which is also uh, we very boring to play. So yeah, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, so you you've got people giving it thumbs up and applause, etc. Here, so um, you you will. Uh, have to rely on me telling you that if you can't see all the little people but you you've got you've got a lot of appreciation there there's a lot going on in the chat there which is uh, somebody's highlighted the, that book about the, the the new nick hayes book the book of trespass i've just bought that for the library that's that's going to be coming in very shortly um oh, that's yeah, that's wrong yeah 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 uh, so have we got anybody who has any particular comments or questions that you want to be asking? Uh, we've so far whizzed through. Uh, there's, there's some very interesting stuff in the chat here, Dave, which I will, will um, let you know. Um, and um, there's some interesting anecdotes and, and a lot of interesting info, that, that, uh, but so far no questions anybody want to yes ali do you want to unmute yeah. yourself oh yeah hi thank you very much for that um i just wanted to remind people really about burnage garden village a garden suburb in manchester which is still owned uh it's rented and i think it's probably the only garden village in the country that is still rented and not privatized 
So you might. That's like very to look interesting. At that. What's the name, Alison? It's Burnage, the name, Alison? Burnage Garden Village. So it uh, built in 1907. Perhaps you could email me. It well, the sounds breaking up. Yep. Okay. Could you and email me that? The name. I, I want to visit it and see it for myself. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, so it's still owned by the co-op and it's rented and exactly on the model that you were talking about. Um, yeah. and, also, and also in Manchester, really about the time of the First World War, there, there's quite a lot of people working around um, land nationalisation and talking about the kind of things you're talking about, particularly a man called Henry Aldridge. Um, and his wife was a suffragette and she went off to work in Serbia during the First World War. So they're a kind of interesting couple. Yeah, that's just Oh, it. yeah. Well, please email me that information. Okay. Your sound breaks. I can't hear it properly. Okay. So I, I would love to uh, read up what he did. I, I left out the campaigns on land nationalisation, but there was people like Spencer writing about land nationalisation. Uh, and, of course, <clears throat> The beauty of a land value tax is you don't physically take the title deeds away from landowners. You just ask them to pay the rent of the land that they're hoping to occupy. And by doing that, land gets used much more efficiently. We wouldn't have empty buildings and empty sites. We wouldn't have uh, uh, so-called builders like Barrett's, which are really land speculators, uh, with 20-year land banks, because if every year they had to pay a 20th of the value of the land to the state if by 20 years they'd have paid the whole value of the land to the state so they would want to build their houses more quickly uh, hopefully better as well okay we've got uh, mark metcalf mark you want to ask a question you want to unmute yourself can you hear me yeah yes yeah uh, well i've got a a number of points that I'd like to make. Obviously, the best book on this issue is the book Who Warns Britain, which was done by Kevin Carhill at the start of this century. Kevin, of course, was, uh, is an active member of uh, the Liberal Party and has been for many years, which I think is indicative in a way that it's come from them and not the Labour movement. Uh, there's a great quote in there uh, which I think sums up also why the rich and powerful like to have land, which is also for their sport. In other words, fox hunting, grouse shooting. Um, and it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, William the Bastard uh, distributed large amounts of land to his mates to go hunting and shooting and killing. And that remains a very important part of the countryside. Uh, people, working class communities will uh, defend on occasions the right for this sport because a small number of people gain jobs and income from that. As somebody who's covered these issues quite extensively on occasions for the Land Worker magazine of Unite, I've often had a great deal of difficulty uh, getting stories about snaring. And myself and Mark, who's a former uh, military man, in terms of taking photographs when pheasants are being killed or butchered or we have landowners walking Pheasants along. or peasants? Sorry? Pheasants or peasants? Uh, well, obviously, we'll come on to the uh, both in a, in a second. I do love the statement which is in Kevin's book, which is by the seventh richest man in the United Kingdom in 1881. And I think it sums it up beautifully. The object to which men aim at when they become possessed of land in the British Isles may, I think, be enumerated as follows. One, political influence. Two, social importance founded on territorial possession. Land is the most visible and unmistakable form of wealth. Three, power exercised over tenantry, the pleasure of managing, directing and improving the estate itself, less so. Four, residential enjoyment, 
People love being in their castles and looking out over the large amounts of lands that they own, including what is called, called sport, and five, the money return, the rent. One aspect which I did feel that you'd uh, not included in the talk was, of course, the removal in most parts of Ireland of those who owned the land and the colonial setting by which uh, loyalists were placed in certain parts of the land, which continues to be at the cornerstone of uh, British politics. Largely, the Labour movement does not want to deal with the issue of Ireland, and that is because of the issue of land. Who occupies the land in the northern part of Ireland remains a very hot and topical potato, let's put it mildly. In the beginning of this century, I wrote or brought together a book called The Richard Play, Fox Hunting, Land Ownership and the Countryside Alliance, which is a great and graphic demonstration of how sport was intricately connected to large amounts of land, 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 land ownership. The Blair government's only serious revolutionary change was the issue of fox hunting in essence, because he also removed from the House of Lords hereditary peers. Seriously, the only significant political change that uh, Blair did to the constitution in, 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 in aspect. And that struggle was a very, very long, very, very long struggle. I actually sold 5,000 copies of the, of the booklet at the time. So there was clearly a great interest in, 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 in the subject. And it shouldn't oh, wow. be forgotten. Yeah. So do you want do you want to stick put, put some of the details of that of that book and other things that you've mentioned yeah, into no the problem. chat? All, what I'm going to say, it's all yeah. online. It's all online on my website, which is Mark Wright. They're all there. And of course, the other thing which shouldn't be forgotten is the fact was it was the trade union, the trade union activist in Benny Rothman who established the right for us to roam on some of these lands. It shouldn't be forgotten that there has been struggles, perhaps not on collecting the land back. Uh, certainly the Labour government had promised the land, based on the land fit for heroes, they promised nationalisation in the 1945s. They went to, they went to, they were elected on that basis and immediately let down the working class, immediately didn't take forward the nationalisation programme. They took forward coal, the rest of them, but land was just completely forgotten. I appreciate okay, Mark, I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Dave to respond in, in, uh, if, he, like if he wishes to join like any of that. Of points. I'd like to get a couple of other points. I, I think, Mark, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just hang on because we'll, we'll just see that we've got other people with their hands up. So, uh, Dave, have you got anything you'd like to, to say in response to Mark? Yeah, welcome your contribution, Mark. And um, uh, I'll go one by one for Kevin Carhill, who owns Britain Knights. He got him on television down in the southwest uh, talking about his book uh, when I was involved in uh, writing a program about who owns the southwest and uh, well, that was some years before the book was published and when he published the book um, I was back in London living and we uh, launched his book with Tony Benn speaking at um, City Hall which it was the earlier city hall that Ken Livingston was in. And um, we uh, welcome what Kevin Cahill comes up with, the facts and figures, uh, most of it based on the Lord Derby um, study of land ownership, which I mentioned in the slideshow. But um, the disappointing thing for me is that I can never convince Kevin Cahill to support a land value tax uh, to redress the wealth. He thinks landowners should be allowed to keep the wealth. Um, Unite Land Workers, that's interesting because the Agricultural Workers Union, which went into Unite, was affiliated to the Labour Land Campaign. But uh, that affiliation ceased when they joined um, the TGWU that became a part of Unite. Um, the 1881 uh, um, thing about political, social power, enjoyment, money, rent. I think that's brilliant. You know, the, all those factors my wife is always mentioning. It isn't just collecting the rent that landowners keep land. It's these other social and political reasons 
uh, as well and the power of people's lives. They sit as the local magistrate and things of that nature. Um, Ireland, I didn't go into. Um, I was really talking about uh, England. I did mention Scotland, so I could have mentioned Ireland. Um, but uh, Henry George visited Ireland and um, I think it was his contribution uh, that led to some of the land reforms that took place I I in Ireland. Um, Blair, I agree with you about fox hunting. Less keen about just getting rid of hereditary peers. peers. He should have got rid of the whole of the House of Lords, even hereditary uh, can have an election and elect about 80 peers. But the other good thing that came was the right to Rome. It wasn't thanks to him, but um, another friend of mine who was in Parliament at that time introduced the bill right to Rome. Um, 1945, we, we've studied every Labour manifesto since uh, the first one in 1905, was it, or 06? Uh, all of them up to the First World War, Second World War, uh, mentioned land value tax. Um, 1945, they mention land nationalisation. They don't commit themselves to do it. They say it's something they'll look at or we Weasley words. Uh, and they certainly didn't mention land value tax. That didn't get mentioned again uh, until Corbyn's 2017 manifesto. He mentioned no value tax. And it's interesting in the 2019 manifesto, Labour, Lib Dems, Green Party, Co-op Party, uh, and indeed the Communist Party, all mention land value tax. So we feel we're on a bit of a roll. But thanks for that contribution, Mark. I'd like to meet you sometime and have a chat. That's it. That's good. That's excellent. Uh, Sarah Redman said she wanted to ask a question. Sarah, can you unmute yourself? I know you were asking about Kevin Cahill as well. Go right, you're on, Sarah. Oh, we can't hear you though. Hello, Sarah. We're not hearing you. No. No, sorry, I don't think that's working. So if you could type type your question into the chat, then uh, I'll I'll definitely ask it on your on your behalf. For some reason, we're we're we're, uh, we're in technical glitchville today. Uh, um, Gordon, you you wanted to to ask something. Yeah, just a quick one. It's just the irony about what you said about Letchworth. Letchworth was originally a private company, and then got got bought out in 63 um, by basically a development outfit. Uh, and it then was nationalized basically to protect it. Come the dissolution of the, uh, of the new towns by Thatcher, uh, it was formed into an IPSA into a trust. So uh, the irony is that the, um, what was originally envisaged for Letchworth, the, the development goes to the development, was actually cemented by Thatcher's government, which is a, a quite strange one. Um, but it is in fact not private, well, it is privately owned, but it's basically owned by a trust for the benefit of the city and the development is, is meant for that. So it's in a sense, um, that is um, uh, how Howard originally intended that it should be. So, which is, uh, it, it wasn't privatised by him. Thanks. So, can I ask a question? Do the householders pay rent to the city, the garden city, or, or do they have freeholds? Most of them, according to what I've just read, or I can remember, most of them, most of the leases are 999 year leases. The 99 year leases on the houses were actually sold to the, uh, were actually sold to the householders. However, the development land is still owned by the, um, still owned by the, um, uh, by, uh, by, the uh, by the trust. Yeah. Dave, I've got, I've got Thank the you. question has come through from Sarah Revan. Oh, do you want, is there anything you want to respond to, to Gordon about? Well, you've noted it for, for your own future reference. 
Uh, so uh, Sarah's question, uh, two questions. Uh, uh, is land value tax your only resolution to the theft of the commons? That's that's to you, Dave. Yeah, because it's not the only solution. We could nationalise the commons and uh, collect the economic rent. Um, and... Um, but the Commons is more, and I didn't have time really to uh, include it, it is it, more than just land, more than just the dry surface of, of this planet. Um, the Commons includes fish in the sea. The Commons includes the airwaves we use for our mobile phones. There's a whole story to tell uh, about how Gordon Brown correctly managed that. Um, the uh, landing slots at airports like I live uh, at Heathrow, near Heathrow, and uh, the landing slots sell for millions of pounds between airlines. Well, a landing slot is permission uh, for a plane to occupy a certain bit of space at a certain time. No airline has manufactured either space or time. That is a commons, and we should be collecting the rent of that uh, and using it uh, to pay uh, for uh, public services. So land value tax, I think, is a kind, gentle way of, of introducing the collection of the rent of the commons. Um, and I analogy I use is like uh, getting rid of slavery. Um, slavery wasn't abolished in one go. It wasn't even abolished in one decade. First of all, trading in slaves was made illegal. But it was another 30, 40 years uh, before the owning and holding of slaves uh, was made illegal. And in fact, longer than that in the United States. So um, I can see us achieving things in, in a gradual way rather than one dramatic step. But I agree that 1945 was the time, uh, or indeed 1997, when you have a Labour government with a big majority, that was the time to take on the landowners. There's a, a, a follow-up, sorry, Sarah, I, I, I saw it later. Is it unthinkable that we reclaim, renationalise the commons to reap collective or universal benefits like in the landlord's game? She also is, is, is really interested in the I idea... I don't really of, understand the question, I'm sorry. Well, there's, there's, a, there's another one from her, which is, don't we need to reclaim the land so we can grow food to feed the British people, especially with supply issues uh, with Brexit and uh, COVID-19? I think the whole question of local production, both in food and in manufacturers, is something that will be helped by land value tax. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Duncan Pickard, he farms in Fife in Scotland. And uh, he says the subsidy from the EU um, to farmers is based on the acreage of land that they control. So it pays him to have as many acres as possible. If there was a land value tax, and no subsidies, he argues against subsidies, he doesn't think they're necessary. If there was a land value tax and no subsidies, he would dispense with some of the acres he currently controls, and those would go to new, younger people wanting to start farming. And he says that uh, LVT would create a blossoming effect in terms of uh, new entrants into farming, and produce being produced and consumed locally instead of everything going into uh, big warehouses and redistributed through uh, supermarkets. And uh, I, I think you're on the right lines, uh, Sarah. I, I think it is important uh, that we bring land into use for our own utility and we encourage people to do those sort of things. There is another argument 
that marginal land has no value, economic value, marginal land. And uh, a lot of land today on which we pay taxes, our income taxes, our VAT, um, our national insurance, those taxes push land which is just above the margin, below the margin, so it isn't used. If we had land value taxed, it would be valued as zero, and these other taxes wouldn't apply, and so therefore that land would come into natural use. Okay, well, and, and what was the name of the person who, who Sarah was saying, what's the name of the person you had that conversation with about land? About the, uh, the, uh, the farmland, land for food? Me? You asking yeah, me or Sarah? I am. I'm asking you. Yes. What? What was oh, it? Yeah. yeah, Dr. Duncan Pickard. He's actually written a book called Lie of the Land on this very subject, advocating no subsidies to farming and advocating land value tax. A Welsh hill farm pays rent to a landowner. If they didn't pay rent. Because it's a marginal site, they wouldn't pay land value tax either. The valuation would be zero. They would be much better off than they are getting subsidies from Europe. We've got we've got a specific question from Liv. Do you know how much of the land has been built on? And she thinks she recalls a report a few uh, a few years ago saying fourteen percent. I think that's a high figure. Um, my figure would be perhaps 12%, um, and uh, housing land is only 2%. Okay, that's some food for thought. Right, I'm going to ask this person here, who I don't know who it is, to unmute yourself because you've had your hand up. Hello, we can't see you. Hopefully we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry, you can't, uh, you can't see. I don't know how to get the camera on. Uh, Dave, the, the the question I had about um, land value tax was if I lived in an area that actually had a low land, uh, you know, a low rental value, and then you had a lot of infrastructure development around it, presumably I would pay more, and yet I might not welcome all this infrastructure. Um, development around me, but I would end up paying more for it according to what you're saying. So how, how would that work in, in, if you were living in an area in low, low rental value and then it increased? And just the other question yeah. I had was an ex, an ex boss of mine said that the enclosure that happened was actually a good thing because uh, the people who enclosed the land improved it. Uh, as, as opposed to when it was common land. Now, is that true? I, I couldn't answer him. It oh, sorry, my name you... is, sorry, my name is Duncan Bowdler. Sorry, my name is Duncan Bowdler. I just saw Franklin ask who, who was speaking. Thanks, Duncan. <laughs> Cheers, Duncan. Uh, yeah, first of all, the enclosure. Uh, there's a lot of academic study that uh, argues there were improvements uh, as a result of uh, enclosures. Uh, the main improvement was for the landowner themselves. Um, there are arguments that uh, big husbandry, etc., cetera, um, is more efficient um, than people keeping uh, a few animals and uh, 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 garden-type production of food. Um, I'm thinking of crofters and losing the crofts in Scotland replaced by sheep. It was much more economic for the uh, landowner, but of course it destroyed people's lives. Um, sometimes literally at the time of the enclosure, but also over a longer period of time. Uh, people were driven from their homes and uh, their whole way of life that had existed for hundreds of years was changed. Um, I don't think that can be considered a good thing. Uh, today, we have young people who try to set up on their own with a small holding and, and want to do uh, small agriculture, not huge agriculture. Um, I don't think it's all about e efficiency. It's about the quality of life. 
And uh, I think the enclosures were unforgivable. And uh, any improvement uh, was probably only to the uh, landowners. As regards um, living somewhere that, let's say, gets gentrified, um, yes, the land, if the land value goes up for any reason, then uh, you will pay a higher land value tax. Um, but uh, what we consider is uh, people that can't afford for whatever reason and don't want to move, uh, but own the freehold, it's the freeholders that would pay the land value tax. Um, when that land gets sold, um, they could pay the tax then. So, for example, you put on the deeds a claim for the land value tax each year. You wouldn't need to pay it each year. And then when the land is eventually sold at a much higher price, either by themselves or the people that have inherited it, then the bill for the land value tax plus its interest would have to be paid. So you can have a deferral system. And the argument is, do we do a means test and only poor people are allowed to defer? Or do we let everybody defer? And my argument would be, I wouldn't allow corporations or companies to defer, but any individual that wanted to defer, I'd allow them to do so because the local authority or the government collecting that money could borrow against that deferment. And uh, the interest they pay on the uh, borrowing would be met by the interest paid on the deferment. So the public would be no worse off. We'd get the services we need today, but the enhanced land value wouldn't go to the freeholder, it would go to the community. But the freeholder could live on that site without paying any extra land value tax whatsoever. Okay, um, but we've got a lot of good stuff in the chat. People are sharing good books that they've read on the thing. So do have a look at that. If, you, uh, if you're if you able to click on the, the little chat button at the bottom of the screen there. And Mark Metcalf has shared his, uh, his website address there. Mark, you wanted to, to come back, so let's unmute you again. Okay, um, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, Luke Agnew is a shop steward at the Birkenhead uh, Flaybrick Memorial Gardens. And as a result of speaking on one of the stewards courses, myself and Luke went ahead and had erected last year a headstone to Edward McHugh who was the leader, one of the leaders of the National Union of Dock Labourers and also a, a big Henry George fan. If you go to my uh, web thing, if you go to my site, you'll find on there a booklet uh, about uh, Edward McHugh and you'll also, which can be downloaded for free, and you'll also find a film that we made about McHugh, which makes reference to Henry George it's a seven minute piece, goes along with other stuff that we're currently being making. As some people may be aware, I helped also produce this book called Bittersweet Brexit by Charlie Clutter Book. What's going to happen on the issue of food and farming in the next few months or years is the most revolutionary change which has taken place in this country since 1947 and before that, going back to 1846. These are not issues which are going to happen in the distant future. These are issues which are live and real now. They are at the cornerstone of the Brexit negotiations. Our attempt to have this book taken up by the trade union and labour movement was a miserable failure. At one point, I wrote an article in Labour Briefing on one page and Jeremy Corbyn wrote another article on the page, the next door page to my article. We gave or attempted to give this to nearly all prominent Labour MPs at all levels of the party. And the impact of that was absolutely zero, no impact at all. Euro MPs who we'd previously suggested should urge the changing of how Britain spent its common agricultural policy funds, which is what the French did it. They gave it to small farmers refused point blank to take up the issue of the fact that we gave our common agricultural policy money 
to large landowners. This book urged that instead of subsidizing large landowners, we subsidized labor. And by just taking away that money from large landowners, it meant that up to 300,000 new jobs could be created at a decent rate of pay in the, in the countryside. As I said, nobody was interested in terms of the things. So I welcome, obviously, yourself speaking. Uh, I think as a great tragedy, uh, it meant that the Labour Party at the election had nothing to say to rural communities, absolutely zero. The nearest it went was that animals should be butchered a bit more kindly. That was it. That was, that was the total sum of Labour Party policy in 2019. And so any hope it had of taking those seats was long lost, long gone. So it's a quite straightforward thing. As we move forward, money shouldn't go to large landowners. It should go towards producing jobs and a future. I mean, I'd love to be in, on here and say we should urge for the nationalisation of land. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, but I'm not a complete, I'm not an off me head type, type person. That ain't going to happen in the very near future, uh, sadly. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you're, you're speaking about these issues and I'm pleased to hear that people are uh, getting an interest and uh, in the issue because they're they're at the cornerstone of our politics at this current time. Cheers. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Cheers. Can I just comment on that because of course. I welcome Mark's contribution. Um, I haven't just started talking about these issues. Um, I've been talking about uh, land value tax and land and improving our uh, environment uh, since I was a kid at school some uh, 64 years ago. And um, Luke Agnew, I'm very pleased to hear Mark mention Luke Agnew. He's a great bloke. And uh, Luke is a member of our Labour Land campaign. And uh, I'd like to invite everybody who's taken part in this podcast to come and join the Labour Land campaign. Uh, we need you. And we now do meet on Zoom. So anybody in any part of the country can take a full active part. Well, that's a, that, that's a good rallying cry. I, I, I think we, we have come to the end of questions and comments. I'll send you the chat, uh, Dave, because there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, but folks, if you, if you were interested, like in the reading list that, that sort of whizzed by on that PowerPoint, we will be uploading this once we've just sorted that that technical glitch at the, the beginning to make sure we're starting at the beginning we will be uploading this to youtube so as soon as we can so you will be able to look at it again and then you can kind of scroll through to to the end of some of those later slides you want to to catch up on all of our talks are on youtube and uh, they're all free to access and that but gives me the prompt to to say again if anybody feels that they're able to donate to the library there's a donate button on our website and we'll be really pleased to hear from you so we're hoping to hear from uh, we're hoping that you'll be back with us this time next week that's on the 14th at the same time two o'clock and ralph darlington from the university of salford who's spoken to us before he's got a he, he's come back with a new topic uh, it is strikers versus scabs violence in the two, 1910 to 1914 labor unrest so uh, do please come back and uh, keep an eye on our events page to see what else is, is coming up. Uh, we're delighted to be here with so many of you still here after a, a, um, a good long session today. So thanks all of you for your contribution. Thank particularly, of course, to Dave for, for um, coming and giving us his impassioned take on, uh, on uh, an unusual but crucial topic. So uh, you're getting some uh, virtual applause coming through here, Dave. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>